Yes, the Spirit of the Lord is moving right now in the world and in His church. Just when the hope of many is fading, God is restoring back hope. As the strength of people is failing, God is increasing strength to many. As many are heart driven away from God to sin and unrighteousness, God is calling and raising men and women in righteousness and truth, gathering them from the ends of the earth unto Himself and into His glorious church. God is calling you right now to come and be part of this great move of the Holy Spirit. Join us in Christ in You Glory Church every week on our Sunday Holy Convocation service to celebrate God in praises and worship and to lift up our voice in prayer and supplication. For He hears the prayers of His people. At Christ in You Glory Church, you can be sure that the Word of God that comes through His servant, Pastor Anthony Adichelle, will meet your need. Now may the Lord grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Christ in You Glory Church, developing a people of righteousness, a planting of God. Hallelujah. Our dear Father in heaven, we give you glory and honor. We thank you, Lord, even for this time in your holy presence. You are faithful. And it is because of your faithfulness that we can stand today alive and well. Lord, in our testimony, we ask, O oh Lord, that your will be done. We pray that the word that we received this morning will add on to the fulfillment of your plan and purpose in the name of our Lord Jesus. Thank you, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. This is the second week in the month of preparation. You know, the Lord spoke to us last week about preparation and we looked in context into what preparation mean, uh, means and we concluded that you know a time of preparation is a time that one is it is the time before the manifestation before the presentation and of course we looked into the book of um, uh, Second Chronicles, chapter eighteen, verse one, where the Bible says the Lord, um, you know, spoke to Elijah and said, "Go and present yourself." And so um, I told you that before a time of um, presentation, there has to be a time of preparation. And so this month is a time of preparation. Is a time that you and I make ourselves ready for the Lord to use as vessels of honor. Because God cannot use a vessel that does not glorify him. God cannot use a vessel that is, um, that is defiled. Praise the Lord. And so, a time of preparation is a time that the Lord... Um, makes his people ready for their, pre their presentation. So that when the Lord presents his people, it will, be, it will be to the glory of his name. If you see someone that is presented before um, his preparation is completed, you will find a person whose fall, whose fall, we bring shame to the name of the Lord. We have seen, you know, this happen from time to time in the house of the Lord. We have seen men, men that had risen to become um, leaders in the church. We have seen men that, you know, have risen to the place where a lot of people look up to them. But because they rose before their preparation was completed, something tripped them and they fell. And the moment they fall, many people fall with them. 
are you with me? Many people fall with them. And, you know, people look at them and they say, if this is what you guys do, I might as well go back into the world I know. So for us, the Lord has not been preparing us all this time without a purpose. Amen. And we need to understand it. And so that is why this morning we are looking into the message that is titled Waiting, the Virtue, the Pain, and the Gains. The Virtue, the Pain, and the Gains of Waiting. If you look at the lives of men and women that the Lord used as champions in the scripture, you find that each one of them, they had their time of waiting. They had their time of waiting. And during their time of waiting, they experienced pain. They experienced what? Pain. And it, it's, it's as if there is no gain without pain. If one is not able to endure hardship, then one cannot enter into gains. One cannot enter into blessings. As a matter of fact, a time of pain is a time of waiting. A time of pain is a time of testing. A time of pain, you know, when, when you, it's like you're going through an exam. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's the exam of faith to test your faithfulness. So from the time that the Lord begins to speak with you, from the time that you begin to believe in the Lord, from the time that you begin to ascend and you begin to say, the Lord is good, the Lord is good, the Lord is good, suddenly, <laughs> the enemy brings you to the time of testing. To hear whether you will still say the Lord is good. Remember that hymn that we read, that we sang about, you know, consecration. When we get to the place where we are being tested, where we are being tested, and in, you know, in that place of testing, you know, some people are tested with sickness, some people are tested with, with um, you know, lack. Some people are tested with a long time of waiting for something to manifest. Our testing is in different ways. The way you are tested is different from the way I am tested. The pain you experience is different from the pain I experience. But if you are not experiencing pain at all, then you can question whether you are on the path. Are you with me? If you are not experiencing pain at all, if all that you are experiencing is, that, is just that, you know, calmness you are just you are just drifting you are you are drifting you are floating you know you are contented in the sense that you know every day is like the same thing to you you are just about your business nothing nothing significant is happening in your life other than that which you have set for yourself then you can question whether you are on the path that's why this morning, you and I would need to look into that word waiting. What does it mean? Because if we say we are waiting, we've got to wait with understanding. 
Because there is aimless waiting. And there is waiting that is what? That is full of purpose. That is purposeful waiting. So if you are waiting for something, if you are waiting, you, are, you have to understand the very reason why you are waiting. If you are in a stagnant position, or if you are drifting, if you are drifting, drifting through, through life, drift, drifting through life, and it's, it's, as if, it's as if you are not driven, you are not driven by anything that is from above, you are drifting, then you have to ask yourself whether you understand the very reason why the Lord created you. Whether you understand what you have to accomplish as a person, an individual. Because for every child of God, <laughs> We were created with a mandate. And that was why I said earlier, when we were talking about encounter, that it is the Lord that encounters a man. Man seeks the Lord, seeks, you know, for the Lord. But it is the Lord that makes himself known to man. Is not man that makes himself known to the Lord. The Lord knew us even before we were conceived in our mother's womb. So we, we, are, in, we are in no position to make ourselves known to the Lord. We cannot say, Lord, look at me. I am tall. I'm tall. I'm, I'm just of, of, you know, I'm of average build. I'm dark in complexion. God knows all of that. Because he created you, he created me. Praise the Lord. So we can do all we can, you know, to, to make ourselves known to the Lord. But it is the Lord that reveals himself. It is the Lord that encounters a man. And I said that until the Lord encounters a man, man will continue to drift through life. But when you come to the place of encounter, it becomes, your life becomes a life full of purpose. It becomes a life that is void of all worldly desires. Your outcome is centered on where? God. Your outcome is to do the will of the Father. Just as the Lord Jesus says, I must do the work of him who sent me while it is day. For night cometh when no man can work. So there is a difference between doing the work of him who has created us, who has called us, who, and who has commissioned us for a purpose and doing the work that we have carved out for ourselves. If you are doing any work today as a believer, as a Christian, Have you, have you looked into the work? How much of the work that you do is unto the Lord? How much is unto yourself? How much of your life is lived for the Lord? And how much is lived for yourself? Praise the Lord. Before we look into the depth of this message, we need to clarify 
what waiting is about. The very first thing is the focus of waiting. The focus of waiting. Why are you waiting? What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? And that's why we need to look into what is going on in the world today and how the heart of man is desperately wicked. And when I say desperately wicked, the wickedness that is in the world today is, is increasing at an alarming rate. It's not decreasing, it is increasing by the day. It has become a world where we have no respect for one another. It has become a world that is selfish. It's all about self, me, me, and me alone. It has become a world that has taken God away from everything. And whatever is, whatever is godly is not regarded at all. If you bring anything that is godly into the affairs of the world, you face immediate opposition. That is the world that we have lived in and that we now live in. And so, the text for this message is from the book of Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. Bible says in verse 12. All right, let's read from verse 7. Or from verse 6. Okay, let's read from verse 6. The Bible says, Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and I saw and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Praise the Lord. You know, any opportunity that I have to correct whatever goes on in the church, I, you, I take it. You find here that the Bible says John said he wanted to do what? He wanted to worship. He says he fell down to worship before the feet of the angel. Because the glory of the angel, you know, was so much. So he wanted to bow and worship him. Just as he did when he saw Christ in John chapter 1, in Revelation chapter 1. And the angel said, see that you do no such thing. For we are all servants of the Lord. You know, today, some people, they worship angels in the churches. They worship angels. They call on the names of different angels. Angel Gabriel, Angel Rahel, Angel whatever. Huh? Are you still in Bethesda? If any one of you remember the message on Are You Still in Bethesda? You will remember that it was the angel that always came to, you know, rouse the water. And the first person that entered the water will, will receive healing, will receive um, solution to the affliction. But then the Lord 
Jesus visited that place because, because you know, the people had become angel worshippers. And the Lord visited the place and put an hand to the place called the pool of Bethesda. Praise the Lord. Verse 10, and he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. To give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. What are you waiting for? What am I waiting for? When we talk about waiting, the very most significant waiting that a man can have, can experience, or go through, is the waiting of the coming of Christ. The waiting of the coming of Christ, that matters more than any other thing. The waiting of the coming of Christ, it should mean a lot to you. It should mean a lot to me. The waiting of the coming of Christ is as significant as when you were being created into this world. So if you and I are engaged in any other thing and everything and our gaze is not set at the coming of the Lord Jesus... Or if we have come to the place where we become comfortable, thinking that the day will no longer come. That's why, you know, we need to examine what exactly is the virtue of waiting. What is the virtue of our waiting? Because if, if, you, if you have not, you know, quantified or qualify and qualify because it has to do with both quantitative and qualitative now. If you have not looked at the context behind the waiting, if you have not appreciated your waiting period, you can fall for anything. You can fall for anything. So you and I can be waiting to get rich. We can be waiting to, 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 to build, it, to buy a house. We can be waiting to, to, to experience fame. We can be waiting to, you know, to be in control of our fears in this world. But if that waiting shifts our gaze away from the waiting that is much more priceless, the waiting that is eternal, of eternal value, then our waiting, you know, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like a waste of time. Because we are, we, we, we are, we are more or less, pay, we are giving our attention to the things that are temporal at the expense of our eternity. Listen. Every minute, someone, somewhere, dies. Every second, somewhere, someone is breathing his or her last breath. And at that time, the race is over. The race is what? It's over. That person can no longer ask for more time to go and make amends. That person can no longer ask for more time to change the course of life. 
the race is over. The, the gates of this world shuts against the person and the gates of eternity opens. And then the question is, how have you lived your life? So in case we forget, Jesus in verse 12 of Revelation chapter 22 says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. And look at how he introduced himself. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. <laughs> look at it carefully. You look at the beginning. Your own beginning. Your own, your own very beginning. He was there. And he will be there when you and I draw our last breath. Is that, what, is that not what it means? I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. So, before you were, he was. Before the world was, he was. And he is never in the past tense. He is. That is his name. He is what? He is the first and he is the last. Why? If you check the book of Colossians chapter 1 carefully. Colossians chapter 1. In the book of Colossians chapter 1, you know, this was where the Lord Jesus is being introduced. From verse 16. Alright? From 15. Let's read from 15. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Alright? For by Him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominion or principalities or powers. Jesus, the Bible says, by him all things were created. So he was he was, he is, and will forever be. His name is what? I am. I am. So it says here, all things were created through him and for him. Next verse, 17. And he is before all things and in him what all things consist kjv says by him all things consist so you see regardless of how we live our lives regardless of how we live our lives all right the time will come when it will all end. But when it ends, the Alpha and the Omega still remains, I am. And then, we will stand before him in judgment and he will pronounce judgment. Revelation chapter 19. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, it says, Now I saw heaven opened, 
And behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head was on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed in, he was, clo he was clothed with a rope dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The Word of God. And if we look into chapter 20, in chapter 20, verse 11 again, it says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven flee away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. Which is the book of life. That is the record. The record that contains the names of those who wait. The book that contains the record of those that wait on him. Are you with me? So when we talk about waiting, we must understand that we are waiting for the promise of him who is to come. When we set our gaze on that waiting, then every other waiting becomes easier. But if we set our gaze on all the other waiting, at the expense of the eternal value of waiting, we miss the mark. Because in the course of waiting for every other thing, you know, we, we do anything and everything to overcome those waiting period. And those things we compromise are called waiting. So think about it. In all our aspirations, in all your runnings, in all your runnings, in everything that you have been doing, is your is, is the waiting that is of eternal value. Is it set before you? Every time you open your eyes. Are you seeing that eternity before you as, as you know, are, are you seeing that destination as the path you are treading? Or have you vied away, vied away, you know, from that path? Are you treading another path? Can you no longer see, you know, heaven set before you? Can you no longer see Christ? Can you no longer see Christ? If you can't see Christ, you can't see heaven. If you cannot see Christ, you cannot see what is ahead of you. If you cannot see Christ, you cannot, you cannot experience the value of eternity. It is when your gaze is continually set on Christ. That's when heaven will continually be before you. That's why, you know, the, you know, the song says, oh, 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 heaven is in our heart. If heaven is not set in your heart, then this world, this world will pollute your heart. This world will pollute your heart. That's when your heart also will become gradually, gradually wicked until it becomes desperately wicked. Now, look at yourself. 
Examine yourselves. The Bible says examine yourself, you know, to see whether you are still in the faith. As your heart turned away from him, or is it set on him? And are you seeing Christ? Praise the Lord. Let me say here, again, that there is a difference between aimless waiting and, and the waiting that is full of purpose, purposeful waiting. Amen. When, when your waiting is purposeful, then you know that there is a reason for your waiting. You know that your waiting is priceless. It's priceless because it is the Lord that says you should wait. Why is that? Because waiting is always founded on promise. Promise. If you have not received a promise, then you cannot wait for the promise. But when you receive the promise, you wait for it. You wait for the promise. The only way you can obtain the promise is when you wait. If you do not wait for it, you cannot obtain it. Now, in the process of waiting for that promise, you go through the pain. You go through the pain. <laughs> and that time of waiting is the time that the enemy tests you. It's the time that the enemy sometimes will bring words before you and ask you to choose it. It is the time that the enemy will come and present an offer, an offer that is too good to be true. And before you, it is true. It brings you all the gold. It brings you all the fame. It brings you everything that you can dream of. And it says, take it. It's free. Take it. But, but, if you are waiting purposefully, you will immediately understand that what you are being what you are being presented with is, 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 is geared towards shifting your gaze away from him. That is true and holy. Let's have that hymn again. The second one. It is because you are setting your gaze. I mean, it is when, when, when you allow, you know, the world to take hold of you. That's when, you know, Christ begins, you know, Christ begins, you know, to decrease in you. But you see, the Bible says, I must increase. I mean, God must increase while I decrease. Thy way, not mine, O Lord, however dark it be, until we come to the place where we do not care what our experience is during our time of waiting because we have one thing that is of greatest value until we come to that place <laughs> we will be missing it are you with me this is a time when the church tells you that you can you you, you know because you are a man of faith you cannot fall sick because you are a man of faith, you cannot be poor. Because you are a man of faith, you cannot, be, you cannot go through trials. No! It's not in the scripture. The Bible says you and I, we will experience persecution. We will go through trials and temptations. But do not say you are being tempted by God, James chapter 1. But it is the devil. Lead me by thy own hand. Choose out the path for me. Next one. Smooth, let it be, or rough. It will still be the best. It will be still the best. You know, winding or straight 
it leads right onward to thy rest. As long as we are on that path, you know, God, God, sets, a, God sets us on a journey. And that journey is rough. You know, we cannot, we cannot tell God, no, Lord, no, that, that, that path is rough. It's rough. You know, if, if I step on this path, my feet will get dirty. If I step on this path, you know, I, 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 I will be humiliated. I will be humiliated. You know, people will mock me. People will say all manner of things against me. We cannot tell the Lord that, no, I am not willing to pass through that. We have to be willing to pass through the path. Because where? Because what? We have a purpose in sight. Because that path is the path that will lead us to our eternal home. If we miss it, that's it. There is no second chance. No second chance. Smooth, let it be or rough. It will be still the best. Winding or straight, it leads right onward to thy rest. Next one. I dare not choose my lot. I would not. If I might, choose thou for me, my God, so I shall walk aright. What is important to you and I? Is it to walk amiss or to walk aright? Is it to walk amiss or to walk aright? Because, you see, we can be walking. But if our walk is amiss, we have missed the mark. But if our walk is set on the path through to eternity, all is well. Next. The kingdom that I seek is thine. We need to clarify that in our period of waiting. Because throughout our life's journey is a life of waiting. We are, we are waiting for the blessed hope of that glorious appearing. That's why you and I, that's why, you know, God has separated us, chosen you and I, set us on the path. And we must understand it. The kingdom that I seek is thine. Whose kingdom are you seeking? Your kingdom here on earth or God's kingdom? Or the devil's kingdom? So, let the way that leads to it be thine. Else, I must surely stray. Until we surrender and submit our will to that of the Lord, we are playing a dangerous game. Playing a dangerous game. Listen. The church, the church is not about the multitude that gather together the church is about the people that set their gaze towards eternity so if multitude of people gather together in the church and their gaze is set on the things of the world it's a vain gathering it's a gathering that is void of the glory of God. And we deceive ourselves because, you know, we attribute, we, are the, we, we attribute success, you know, to the gathering of multitude in a place. Even if they are not doing the will of God, even if they are celebrating man, even if all they do is to tell the people you are going to succeed in this world, even if they are telling you that there is nothing like heaven. Heaven is here on earth. Do you know that? That's, you know, most of these big time ministers, do you know that's what they believe? Huh? I read, you know, some time ago, I think about two, three years ago, I think it was in the New York Times. In the New York Times, about a church I'm not sure if it was New York Times or it's one of the churches in the United States. 20,000 member congregation. And the pastor there, the pastor there says there is no God, there is no heaven. 
there is nothing like heaven. It's here. So, everyone is celebrating how they can succeed here. How they can make it. How they can be happy. Huh? 20,000 plus people going on the same path to where? To hell. Even wrote a book. I was reading it and I was sad in my spirit. The heart of man is desperately wicked. At least, if you want to go to hell, eh, go to hell, why must you take multitude of people to the same place that you are going? And yet, people flock in, people flock in, people flock in, and they get into the place, and all that, you, you know, in the church, where, including those who believe in the Lord or not, everyone sing praises to the Lord, everyone dances to the Lord, because that's what the church wants. Let us dance, let us sing, let us be happy in the church. And when the time for the, the message to come, you know, it's the words that we, you know, calm the people, the word that we, that we make them happy, joyful, the, the word that we celebrate them. Praise the Lord. Huh. If you are in a place like that, you are living in a dangerous world. Get out before it's too late. What are you waiting for? What am I waiting for? What are we waiting for? Why are we gathered together? Let's quickly go to the book of Ephesians as we close because of our time. Chapter 4. The Bible says from verse 11, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Twelve, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Listen, the very reason why, you know, we have leadership in the church. Leadership in the church is being clarified here, isn't it? It's for what? The Bible says, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. 13, to fulfill one purpose. It says, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by, with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Listen. That's why we have the church. If the church is not, is not encouraging, you know, towards righteousness, towards Christ-likeness, then the church is failing. The church is failing. The church is not looking to heaven. It's not looking to eternal life. The church is looking to the worldly affairs. Praise the Lord. And maybe we should look at the seven churches in Revelation once again. To understand where the church stands today. The seven churches. But Christ is the head of the church. And he sent warnings to the seven churches before it was too late. But the seven churches that received the warning did not act on the warnings. And so today, 
where are the seven churches? The seven churches were located in the present-day Turkey. And in the present-day Turkey, church, Christians in Turkey today, they are less than 1%. They are not even up to 0.5%. So if we are not careful, the church of today is in the danger of becoming extinct like the seven churches in the book of Revelation. But you know one thing, before the church goes into extinction, the Lord will revive his own church. That is the church that is after his own will. The church of Christ can never go into extinction. It is the church that goes outside of Christ's will that goes into extinction. So whether it be a church with multitudes of people, as long as there is a church of Christ, that is faithful and that is looking to Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith, then all is well. So this morning, what is our call? To look unto him, the author and the finisher of our faith. And I pray that the Lord will help us in the name of the Lord Jesus. Behold, it says, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. For every pain, there is always the gain. And our gain, after everything that we go through as believers, is eternal life in Christ Jesus. May the Lord bless us in the name of the Father the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let's bow our heads and recommit ourselves once again unto him who has called us. Jesus says, you have not chosen me. I have chosen you and I have called you so that you and I may go and bear fruit. But we cannot bear fruit if we, have, if we are not seeds after the kind of Christ. It is when we are seed after the kind of Christ that we can bear, go and bear fruits after the kind of Christ. And I pray that the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you that you should go and bear fruits and that your fruits should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you these things I command you, that you love one another. And, of course, that revelation that we read in 22 verse 12 and 13, the conclusion again in verse 14 says, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to, be, to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. May the Lord help us to stand to the end in the name of Jesus. Our Father in heaven, here we are recommitting ourselves unto you in the name of Jesus. We plead for mercy and grace. And we ask, O oh God, 
that, that, that the life we now live will be a life that is in Christ Jesus. Seeking that which does not perish, that which is of eternal value, and not being compromised by the affairs of this world, for we have been bought with a price. And so we pray that the blood of Jesus that was shed for us will not go waste in the name of Jesus. But the value of the shedding of Christ Jesus, uh, the shedding of the blood of Christ Jesus, even will bring us into the place of righteousness. And in righteousness, we will continually walk, even in the name of the Lord of hosts. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, the Spirit of the Lord is moving right now in the world and in His church. Just when the hope of many is fading, God is restoring back hope. As the strength of people is failing, God is increasing strength to many. As many are heart driven away from God to sin and unrighteousness, God is calling and raising men and women in righteousness and truth, gathering them from the ends of the earth unto Himself and into His glorious church. God is calling you right now to come and be part of this great move of the Holy Spirit. Join us in Christ in You Glory Church every week on our Sunday Holy Convocation service to celebrate God in praises and worship and to lift up our voice in prayer and supplication. For He hears the prayers of His people. At Christ in You Glory Church, you can be sure that the Word of God that comes through His servant, Pastor Anthony Adichelle, will meet your need. Now may the Lord grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Christ in You Glory Church, developing a people of righteousness, a planting of God.